Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm Alexander Bolivar, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is managing editor, Ross John Fortuna. Hi, Ross. Hi, Alex. You had the opportunity to chat with Jennifer Polka, former U.S. Deputy CTO and author. How'd it go? It went great. I, I think her book is really interesting. And her time in Washington, really both standing up the USCS and more generally seeing with a new set of eyes fuels this, the book's sort of gospel of making implementation better for customers and for government. So tell me about this book. I'm not sure how many authors we've actually had on GovCast. This is a really exciting guest we have. Yeah, it came out this year. It's called uh, Recoding America, and it's about the ways that public sector organizations, agencies in the federal government and state government and how they interact, where they miss the mark on implementation of policy. A big part of the book is about the distance that a lot of policymakers are from the actual policy and actual implementation and the problems that can come up because of that distance and how much people who are in the implementation world, they're not at the table when policy is being made and when decisions are being made about how to implement this policy. That's a somewhat small slice of the whole pie of the book, but that's something I know she and I really talked a lot about because you know, she comes from, from Silicon Valley to a certain extent and and from the nonprofit world from Silicon Valley, she started Code for America. And that's a very different culture than the culture of the federal government and to a lesser extent state governments. There's much more bureaucracy and there's much more staidness. It's very inert in a lot of ways. And so Silicon Valley, of course, is sort of famous for move fast, break things, but that's not the ideal way for government, obviously. So finding somewhere in between there is something I know she really, uh, she and I really talked about when we, we chatted. But the book is interesting because it comes from that perspective of someone who is customer and citizen experience focused as opposed to policy. And because of that, she looks at implementation through those eyes. It's something I know, not to get too deep into my own hobby horses, but that's something that I always get frustrated with in the time that I've covered this world. Policymakers oftentimes have really big ideas and they say, we are going to do this. And sometimes they even make laws that say we're going to do this big thing. And healthcare.gov, which Jen talks about in the book a little bit, is an example of this policy and this implementation that was so far away from the people who were actually implementing it that it went sideways pretty quickly because a lot of people have big ideas, whether it's in Congress or even at the appointee level. But the actual people who have to do it and get it to citizens, they're pretty far away. And the citizens just want the service, the benefit, the whatever. And uh, there's a lot about that in the book about that implementation problem and that development problem. That's all really fascinating. And I can't wait for us to dive into your conversation. So let's not keep our listeners waiting. Let's take a listen. Jennifer Pocket is the founder and former executive director of Code for America. She also served as U.S. Deputy Chief Technology Officer for a year under President Barack Obama and while there helped found United States Digital Service. She's also the author of the book Recoding America, Why Government is Failing in the Digital Age and How We Can Do Better. Welcome to GovCast. Thanks. Great to be here. So your book has a lot of great stories about your time in public service many of which come from when you first came to D.C. So what did you learn from your, quote, fellowship year of sorts at the Office of Science and Technology? Yeah, I think some of it I learned there, and then some of it I learned in reflecting after that year at OSTP, helping stand up USDS. But I think ultimately where I landed was I had a question about why government is sort of slow to take technology seriously. And in the end, I think it's really that 
technology and digital are just part of implementation. And government really believes, especially in places like the White House, that what's important is policy and that the implementation of it is sort of someone else's job and that those people are not as important as the folks who set the policy agenda. And um, when digital sort of got has got caught up in this branding of implementation as less important, that's ultimately, I think, the big reason we have such problems adopting both technology and really having a core competency of people who do technology in government. Well, that's a concept that's throughout the book is this idea that the people making the rules, people making the policy, and the people who are actually implementing systems and modernization and things like that, that there's a real distance there. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to bridge that in a meaningful sort of quick way? I don't think there's a quick way to do it, but I would say the evidence is that it is happening. I talk in the end of the book about covidtest.gov. You know, you look at the outcome of that and it shipped in a couple of weeks. It was delightful to users. It got garnered enormous praise everywhere in social media. Um, and it really started to rebuild trust, I think, between the public and government after a time when there'd been some you know, great successes, but also some great failures during COVID. And if you look at why it happened that way, it's because the Biden incoming Biden administration invited the team that would need to implement this to the table before they ever announced it, while they were still crafting what that would actually be. And that's really rare. I'm, I'm not trying to say it only happens under Democratic in, in administrations or in the Biden administration in particular, but you see things like that happening now that simply wouldn't have happened or been very hard to have happen, say, five or 10 years ago when it was like, you know, you bring in the tech folks when everything important has already been decided. Well, why haven't people who implement the policy, why haven't they had a seat at the table? I think it's just very deeply ingrained in our culture. Um, it's in our culture, which, of course, in some ways derives from British culture, the language that the British use describing their civil service is that there are the intellectuals and the mechanicals. Intellectuals are, you know, people doing strategy and policy, and the mechanicals are those responsible for implementing it. And they're, they are di distant in just a huge variety of ways, right? They're in different buildings, they're in different social circles, they're in different conversations. And um, you really have to just go back to these very profound assumptions. They're certainly in codified in law and policy in various ways, but they're much more deeply codified just in our human assumptions about how government is supposed to work. But, you know, if, and I don't mean to glorify Silicon Valley by any means, but, you know, if you come out to Silicon Valley, it's the opposite. It's the people who are implementing digital products and services that drive out, out here. I'm, I happen to be in California right now, but I'm that at this point, about halftime California, halftime East Coast. But it's just a profoundly different culture that says, let's start with how this is going to work. Let's start with how people are going to use it. And we build the policy from the ground up instead of the other way around. So it's, it's not that it can't exist within our culture. It's that we've got to find those models and find what's best of both of them. There's a lot to learn from Silicon Valley culture. There's a lot to learn that's good about government culture and public service. And, you know, why are we doing this? So it, it's not that I want us to do it one way. It's that I want us to remember that the way it happens in government today is not, you know, it's not the weather. <laughs> it's not determined by God. <laughs> it's choices that we may have had and we can make different ones. But we really have to look beyond just like what policy is it that's holding us back and into how are we thinking differently? And, and how can people with power be invited into thinking about how these assumptions are not really serving us well? Even those people who can sort of dictate what happens in government very often are frustrated. They're not happy with it either. So we've got to invite them into a conversation about how it might be different, really, really from the ground up. Well, that you talk a lot about waterfall style development yeah. in the book about how it can be a, a real roadblock here versus building the boat as you go, the sort of agile development notion of learning while you're doing. Yeah. Why is waterfall development so pervasive in government? and? To build on that, how does it affect particularly modernization projects? 
I mean, I think um, I want to be clear that in writing the book, I wasn't necessarily writing for government CIOs and other folks in, in maybe in technology and agencies. I'm really not trying to say, please adopt, you know, a specific kind of agile development. There are a lot of ways to get to what I'm talking about, which is a feedback loop rather than this, you know, this sort of hierarchy through which projects descend that can be very damaging. And what I'm really saying is it's less about the choice of development methodology and more about the environment in which these projects are occurring. Very, very hard to practice agile software development in a waterfall culture. And I think that's been the thing that's been frustrating folks in government for so long. You're told to do this thing, but it simply doesn't fit the way everything else around you is happening. So my audience is is beyond the, the tech folks. My audience is those who could say, wait a minute, if we want these better outcomes from technology, there's something we have to do. We policymakers, oversight folks, people who are determining how projects are funded. The, the shift to what can be called agile, but really could go by a million different names and really is about sort of collapsing some of that distance between the policy intention and the actual implementation. Like that needs to happen from those concentric circles out. I think people have been pushing on it from the inside out. Now it has to start coming from the outside in. Where's that outside in coming from? From just citizens or from, you know, yeah. I know you talked about policymakers, but this culture is pretty pervasive. Yeah, I mean, I think um, absolutely I see more policymakers at the state, federal and local level now engaging with these ideas saying, OK, I'm not just going to yell at the tech people for, you know, projects that go over budget and, and over schedule. I'm going to look to what I'm doing that is making it hard for them to succeed. So that's great. And we need uh, like a million times more of it, but at least it's starting to happen. And it, it's very um, gratifying to me. But yeah. Ultimately, a lot of this stuff derives from things that government CIOs and others don't have control over, like how your projects are funded and how they are overseen, what you're held accountable to, what you're asked to provide throughout to show what, you know, what progress you're making. And I don't, you know, that is behavior that ultimately does implicate our elected officials. And so our elected officials aren't fundamentally going to change until the public gets involved in this conversation. So the way I've been describing it when I talk to audiences who've read the book, who you know aren't on the inside of government, and but want to know what they can do as just regular citizens, I say, look, when a elected official or a candidate asks for your dollar or your vote, what's the first thing you do? You say, do your values match mine? And that's important. But very quickly, you have to move to another question, which is, look, we have a garden here that hasn't been tended. And the gardening analogy is important because I think we all feel now that the seeds that we're planting in the garden aren't growing. So elected leaders policymakers, lawmakers think their job is to go plant a seed in the garden. And if what grows provides shade or fruit or flowers for the public, that's how they get their glory. That's how they get reelected. But we can feel that those seeds aren't growing into what they're supposed to grow into. That's the whole premise of the book, this implementation gap. And so if the public starts to say, hey, electeds and appointeds too, your job isn't just to plant seeds. Your job is to tend the garden. And that means, you know, making sure it has soil and water and, you know, uh, that we've pulled the weeds that have come up before or, you know, things that were planted in the past that are no longer serving us. That means backwards looks at the sort of clutter of policy that has accumulated over the years that makes it so hard to do anything in an agency. Until the public starts saying to our leaders, hey, it's also your responsibility to tend the garden. How are you doing that? How are you making things easier for the people and administrative agencies to get stuff done? How are you tending to the health and well-being of the civil service, right? You know, I don't think people realize how much we've tried to extract out of public servants over the past 
let's just call it 30 years, more and more we want out of them. But we're not actually tending to their health and well-being. We're not making things easy for them. We constantly make things harder. We layer on more and more mandates. Until we have that conversation and electeds realize that they're going to get these questions when they go in front of donors and voters, this isn't going to change or it's not going to change fast enough. And it needs to change a lot faster than it is today. Yeah, the incentive system is fairly out of place, I would say, for electives to a certain extent, because uh, governing doesn't always, let's say, come to the fore or get rewarded. But you've mentioned layering. So this is going to sound odd for people who haven't read the book. And I do recommend the book. It is a interesting read, certainly for anybody who who knows the difficulties of implementation. But I trust you can answer it definitely. Archaeology. I wasn't mm-hmm. connected to uh, DC and implementation in the IT world. Let me explain how I came to this metaphor of archaeology. I was working during the first summer of the pandemic on a what was called a strike team, though I prefer to call it a task force, for the governor of California because our state, like many others, well, I think all others, had a backlog of unemployment insurance claims. Um, you know, incredible spike in applications and not an ability to process that many. Everybody, of course, assumed and said publicly that the problem in all states was that there's COBOL in unemployment insurance systems. There is. It's not, you know, it's not these things are made 100% of COBOL, as most people here, I think, will know. And in fact, you know, what we found going in to the Employment Development Department in the state of California was that the parts of the system that were written in COBOL were doing great. <laughs> they paid, I think, by the time I joined, 4.4 million people their claims already. But there were parts that were not working. And the illustration of that came when my colleague Marina was sitting with a claims processor for about a week, you know, over and over again, going through them. What's going on here? Where are we stuck? Where can we find the leverage points to get this backlog that turned out to be 1.3 million claims paid out so that those people could, you know, get their money and get their benefit? And one of the guys she kept talking to said, Oh, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. Let me defer to my colleagues who've been here longer. I'm the new guy. And after about the fifth time she said that, he said, she said, okay, you're the new guy. How long have you worked here? And he said, I've only worked here for 17 years. (laughs) The folks who really know how to process a claim have been here 25 years or longer. And we're not talking about IT folks here. We're talking about claims processors. The policy and law and guidance and process that govern UI in California, but in other states too, is incredibly complex. And if you think about it, of course it is, because UI derives back from the 1935 Social Security Act. So we're coming up on almost 90 years of the accumulation of law and policy that is always added and never subtracted. Uh, There was a great labor commissioner of the state of New Jersey, um, Rob Asaro Angelo, who, when he was asked to testify about why they had a backlog, he brought these giant boxes and put them on the table where he was testifying in front of the state legislature and said, you want to know what's wrong here? 7,119 pages of active guidance and and, and policy governing what we do. Until you simplify that and take away what's no longer serving us, we're going to continue to have backlogs whenever we have a spike in claims for unemployment insurance. You can blame the COBOL all you want, but that's just, that is really pointing fingers where I think, again, there's sort of a class of people in government that needs to start to look in the mirror a little bit about the problems that we have. And I think uh, Commissioner Asaro Angelo did a great job of that. But I, I still think that if you ask the most people on the street, why did unemployment insurance claims get backlogged during the pandemic? They'll say COBOL. And I don't think that's the right answer. So anyway, back to your question about archaeological layers. The COBOL is just the bottom of decades of archaeological layers of technology that you can point to. And that's why people think we're not paying these claims. And it's part of it. But those archaeological layers of technology map to archaeological layers of policy. And I really want the public to start to understand 
that that is also something we're going to need to tackle, not just modernization of the technology, but modernization of the policy frameworks that govern it. I know a lot of people who have worked in any job in any organization have seen the layers of technology that can build up. Oh, you have to use this and then you have to do this. If If you're in like most private industry, that's not required by statute. So it's mm-hmm. a different animal when you're in, in public service. And I think that was why the the analogy, I think, is such a interesting one. But you talked about oversight a little bit and how that contributes to this and risk aversion. I think the statutes and things like that are, are part of it. So can you kind of expand on how the risk aversion problem pervades government and implementation? Yeah, well, it pervades in a, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I tell a couple of stories in the book about ways in which we actually have policy intent, you know, up here at the top. And then because we have a waterfall, essentially a hierarchy through which that descends rather than a feedback loop, as it descends through, you end up with something that really doesn't honor the intent at all. It either doesn't get exactly what, you know, enough of what it was asked for, or it gets the opposite. And the reason for that flip as it descends through the hierarchy is that at every step that it descends, somebody makes a decision that's essentially better safe than sorry. So I tell a long story about um, a project at the Air Force that was um, designed to update the software on the GPS satellite, sort of famous project called OCX, which maybe many of your uh, your your audience knows about, in which a friend of mine goes to help out Raytheon to try to get this thing shipped because it's you know at this point several years late and several billion dollars over budget. And he finds that while a really simple technology would work just fine, in this case, it was multicast UDP, um, they're using a very complicated enterprise service bus that sort of makes this Rube Goldberg machine in between two things that could be very simple. And because that Rube Goldberg machine is there, the ability to get the data from the satellites to the ground stations is, is broken because it times out as it goes through this crazy Rube Goldberg machine. Um, And he says, why are you using this? And of course, it's not that the programmers are stupid and think that we need an ESB there. It's because it's in the requirements from the Air Force to Raytheon, so they can't remove it. And they're told that it's required by law. In fact, it's required by the enterprise architecture of the Air Force and the DOD, and they believe the federal enterprise architecture requires it. But of course, if you go back and look, you know, federal enterprise architecture ordered by Congress, essentially, from the 1995 Clear Cohen Act, Congress never said use an ESB. It started to be used as an example of interoperability in some of these documents, including the FEA, which your folks are far more familiar with than I am. And at each step that it was translated down to the DOD, EA, and the Air Force e, uh, Enterprise Architecture, somebody said, well, it looks like they're specifying an ESB. Let's make sure we put that in here without regard to the fact that it was really just optional. And so you get this more and more codified, more and more maximalist, more and more rigid interpretation at every step down in the waterfall. And you end up with a piece of software in this OCX project that nobody feels they can remove because it is now has been codified into the project. And it the, the project ships, but with the or the, the satellite ship, but they have to go back up into space without the new software because they can't get this thing working. So billions of dollars later, you're using the same old software because of essentially risk aversion in a hierarchy. Yeah, nobody wants it to be their fault. I understand that. It's it's, yep. it's understandable to be somewhat conservative, but certainly an overarching, I think, theme of this conversation is something that I know I talk to a lot of people who are in my life who are not either in DC or, or familiar with this stuff is they just want it to get done. They don't they don't know. Yep. And the government's job to serve them. It doesn't matter what layer, what whatever, and, and that those uh, roadblocks can be a real problem for the people, of course. And that's a major CIX problem, I think. Yeah, I think the thing that I want people to take away from the book, and again, this is written for the general public who may not know what it's like to work in tech and government, is that those folks who are being risk averse are not bad or dumb or lazy in any way. They are subject to what I call the accountability trap, 
where they are supposed to get outcomes, but their careers depend on fidelity to process. And the, the incentives are, are really wrong. And so if we want people to act differently, we've got to change the incentives. It's not blaming them constantly for the decisions that they make. Now, having said that, of course, I, you know, I, I do want to lift up those public servants who are making less risk averse decisions because I think they serve as a model for, for others. But that gets back to your earlier question about oversight. You know, all of our oversight mechanisms are targeted at finding things that went wrong. If you as a public servant know 7,000 different ways you can get in trouble, or maybe not in trouble, but just investigated in a way that's going to take up all of your time and keep you from doing the work that you came to this agency to do, of course, you're going to be risk averse. There's 7,000 ways that you can get in trouble, and there's almost no ways that you can get elevated or celebrated for the incredibly difficult and important work that you do. And when folks in the Hill and in the press ask me, you know, what can we do to change this risk averse culture? You know, I think it's really on them. I think half of our oversight apparatus should be targeted at finding public servants who've made great choices, sometimes at risk to their careers, and saying, this is the kind of behavior that we want to re reward. We don't need to, you know, be a pop, you know, I'm not saying we need to become like a private sector kind of institution and give them giant bonuses. I think a little thank you every once in a while would go a long way, not just in keeping public servants who are subject to this terrible accountability trap, you know, um, with you know, keeping their morale up, um, but also in providing a model to everyone else saying, this is the kind of behavior that's going to be rewarded. And it's going to give pause to those in, you know, other oversight roles who want to get them in trouble for that exact same behavior, right? It's often just risky behavior. So, We've got to we've got to change again the culture in which folks operate, and part of that is changing how fundamentally how oversight is done. I will say there's five or six other elements of oversight that you know we could talk about at greater length, but I think that first piece of a, an exclusive focus on what went wrong is creating risk aversion is probably the number one point to talk about. Well, what are some of the other types of oversight that are part of this? Well, we, um, if you think about how, again, I don't mean to lionize Silicon Valley in any way. I have lots of problems with how things go on out here. But if you have a startup, for instance, that's that's the oversight that they receive is is from their funders, right? Their board, and and, and um, they don't come show documents about requirements that have been checked off the past quarter. They come show the product. And they talk about the user research that they've done and how the people who are going to use this software or potentially are already using this software are finding it and the benefit that they're getting out of it. And it's just a fundamentally different way of communicating progress that really puts user needs at the center. And then you can talk about the government needs, right? Dif difference between, big difference that I talk about a lot in the book between user needs and government needs. I'm not saying we don't need to take care of government needs. I'm saying they should not be 99% of our effort because that is all we can do. So there's different ways that we can be, uh, that we can be asking for updates on things that are not just how far over budget and how over schedule are you? How many requirements have you at least checked off on paper instead of how many things does this actually do for the user that turn out to be valuable? I think there's also just a lot to be said about how projects are funded in the first place, which is of course going to drive then how they are overseen. You know, we don't staff these projects internally as well as we should, we are quick to provide capital expense. Here's a big chunk of money that you can give to a vendor without saying, wait, do we have enough people inside who know what this project is actually supposed to achieve? Are we allocating the appropriate operating expense before we go giving a huge chunk of capital expense? And what kind of roles do we need in those um, internal team members in order to do this well. And so that has to be part of the oversight as well. Um, you know, but fundamentally, I think we are constantly looking at these things as projects where many of them should be products. And there's a big difference between the two. 
the reason we have such a problem with modernization in government is that we fund in you know primarily these big chunks, right? You get funding for a project, you staff it up, it's got a couple years of quote unquote development, then it launches and it goes into O and M. That's not how projects products that we all use today are funded. They're funded in an ongoing way over time. And they don't, you know, you never hear from, let's say Slack, for example, oh, hold on, we're in a big modernization. They are modernizing every day, every week. They're adding new features. Yes, when they need to move off some old infrastructure and onto new one, that's maybe, you know, a spike in, in, in expense and effort for a little while, but you don't go into o &M ever. Um, you're constantly funding something to get better over time, to adapt to changing needs and policies. And, you know, we, again, have a very long way to go to convince those who are in charge of how agencies and technology and agencies are funded that this would be, in the end, far better, <laughs> far cheaper, and just create so much less drama. Yeah, in the non digital world, that I can sort of squint and see how that works. But um, obviously, in, a, in the age where things are moving so quickly, the notion that this stuff is uh, so set in stone is is a little unbelievable to me. I, I spoke to someone from IRS a little bit ago about these things. And certainly congressional budgeting is a major problem because you can't sort of do long term things when you're on CRs every uh, year or so. But Yes. Generally, yeah, that, you know, you and in your book, you write about it, you know, the modernization, the IRS modernization projects are constantly the goalposts are being moved because because of the cultural problems, I think, with a lot of a lot of these things. And I'm super, super positive on IRS right now. I think that they're in a, a, a hopeful space that's really unique. And and I'm I'm just really eager to see them succeed now. Great leadership. Yeah, there's there's certainly. A lot of workforce concerns about, you know, people who can do the things that uh, IRS needs. They're, they don't grow on trees for sure, but certainly yeah. I think they're in a better position now than, than anyone. So I, I want to, we've, we've gone on very long, so I, I apologize for taking up so much of your time, but this is uh, something I like talking about. So we'll end on this question about digital as part of implementation, because you note that it's often an, uh, an afterthought when it comes to implementing policies, then digital, will, it's just a small part of it or something. When, the computer is everything is something I like to say. Mm -hmm. Going into the future, do you think this is going to change because digital services are becoming more and more a part of our lives? It is changing. I mean, um, so much is changing. I think the thing that is one of the best measures for me is the number of agencies now that just have internal capacity for this. That's not just procurement capacity, but product management skills. And they, you know, HHS is a great example of an agency. and the various components of it, but certainly CMS, where now they're very proud that they have people like user researchers around and that they're able to actually do the kind of work that was just so hard to do before. Not that you can't outsource your user research, but it's great that they have these internal capacities. So there's so much changing. And then, of course, we're in this AI moment where a lot of what has needed to change, I think, suddenly is, you know, the opportunities to do that open up. I'm not one to say, you know, just charge full speed ahead without thinking about the consequences into AI. But I think so many people think about AI and things like benefit determinations, and they get quite worried um, that you'll have arbitrary decisions being made by, you know, machines that we don't really understand. And the reality is that I, I don't, I can't verify the statistic, but I saw on Twitter the other day that something like 40% of determinations for SNAP eligibility are Rooney's today with people. So let's be realistic about the fact that there are always errors. And if the baseline is pretty bad, I think, you know, I'd rather have 10% or 20% errors in, in snap determination if the existing is 40. <laughs> um, I'm okay with that, even though a decision, you know, and, and there's got to be good appeals processes, which the AI executive order has, has dealt with, I think, you know, head on. But the other thing that I think people forget about that AI can do for us in this moment is back to my thing about 17 years to learn how to understand the policy in, uh, on a program like UI. There's enormous opportunity, not just for technologists delivering services, 
but for policymakers to say, you know, how can we simplify those 7,119 pages in a way that will really open up and enable possibility within the agencies to do service delivery better? But again, let's just stop pointing the fingers at the tech people all the time and broaden this uh, conversation to the others that need to be at the table to solve these problems. It certainly is a huge cultural problem that I hope, you know, is being somewhat ameliorated because as, you know, we talked about customer service is about delivering results, not anything else, really. People just, the job is the job. People want the job to get done. I think that's a big part of what Recoding America is about. And as such, thanks so much uh, for being on the show with us. Thank you. It's been a delight to talk. Thank you, Ross. That was a terrific chat that you had with Jennifer. Before we let our listeners go, are there any last highlights or takeaways that you want to leave them with? Well, I think the conversation about risk aversion was is also something we want to always keep in mind. You know, I mentioned when we introed about Silicon Valley versus the bureaucracy and sort of finding something that combines both and takes the best of both worlds. And the risk aversion side of it is where I think so much of implementation on the bureaucracy side of things is such a problem. People don't want to run afoul of the billions of rules that are happening. So they have to find a way to thread that needle, and it's really hard. So the culture of government is such a big part of that. And and I know Jen and I talked about that, but I think reading the book, you get that uh, in spades. Thank you, Ross. And obviously, listeners, if they were interested by your conversation, should check out Jennifer's book. I'm sure it's available wherever books are sold. But with that, that is all for today's GovCast. We'll be back next week with a brand new conversation. But in the meantime, if you like what you heard, make sure you leave a five-star rating and a review on the podcast platform of your choice. And tell a friend. It is the end of the year. We're seeing a lot of family members. And if you have, let's say, an uncle who's really into federal IT but doesn't know about us, now's the time to tell him. Anyways, thank you all for listening. I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Ross Tronfortune. Thank you for listening. GovCast, along with HealthCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. If you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. 